Okay, for part two of our lecture number two, we'll begin with Abigail Adams and her letters to her husband, John Adams. Um, hopefully you'll uh, forgive me a bit for toggling back and forth a little bit. First, I'll go over a few things, and then we'll go to the text, which is online. Um, hopefully you were able to access that easily. I, I, I hope so anyway. Um, the um, So I wanted to bring up the fact that this is a very personal, candid set of pleas to her husband. She's um, This is on the eve of the signing of the Declaration and uh, we won't go into a big history lesson here, but what's important is um, the points that she makes, which are uh, you, John, are fighting against tyranny and for liberty, and this is a, they had a very interesting relationship with one another. It was quite, um, it was very loving, um, and it was very mutually supportive, but they, they tussled a bit, and they believed in a good intellectual argument every now and then, and so uh, when you see this in the letters, don't think that she's being mean-spirited or anything of that nature. Think, nope, she, she gave and she took just like he did, uh, back and forth. They, they sort of sharpened themselves um, intellectually on each other. Um, and so what she points out is says, uh, do you not basically see the failure to secure women's rights as being hypocrisy? If you're fighting against tyranny and for liberty, uh, why would you not do that for everyone? Why would you do that for women as well as men? And then the appeal that I want you to see is both religious and political um, without an attempt to appear too radical. She's, she, she, she reassures him that women are not trying to overthrow men or, or dominate men in any way. We're just looking for uh, an equal voice and an equal opportunity uh, in this new republic that they're trying to create out there. So if we can, I'll sk skip on through here and get to the other um, slide where the text is. Take a look here, if you would, uh, her first letter in March here that we have in front of us. She says, uh, um, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. So she's, she's, she's really um, revolutionary as well as he is. She's like, no, we want our own country. Let's no reconcile, right? So Adams was that way, and so was his wife. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose to be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable the, to them than your ancestors. Don't put such unlimited power power into the hands of the husbands. First of all, they're just doing a declaration of independence. They haven't started up with a constitution. That's not going to come for quite some time. we got to win a war first, lady. Um, but she's already putting a bug in his ear about it. She Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could, right? So so what is the thing that they keep calling King George a tyrant, a tyrant, a tyrant? It's like, look, look, now you, you get rid of one tyrant. If you create a nation full of tyrants who are tyrannical with their wives, that's not, you haven't gotten yourself anywhere. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. You see, foment rebellion, right? A rebellion, uh, just like a revolution. And we are going to, you can't, you can't, have laws where we don't have representation, right? The taxation without representation thing. So she's really saying, look, if you're going to do this for the for this creation of this new country and in favor of your rights, you need to understand that there are rights for both both sexes. She says that your sex are are naturally tyrannical is as is a truth so thoroughly established as to admit of no dispute. Right? You, you cannot argue with me that men are tyrannical because they are. They just are. And he said, why then put not put in a, in not put it out of the power of the vicious and the lawless to use us with cruelty and indignity and impunity. Um, in her other letter on the April 14th, 1776, uh, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot laugh. I cannot but laugh. We've been told that our struggle has loosened the bonds of government everywhere that children and apprentices were disobedient, that schools and colleges were grown turbulent, that Indians slighted their guardians and Negroes grew insolent with their masters. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, she means women, more numerous and powerful than all the rest, were grown discontented. This is ra a rather too coarse a compliment, but you are, a, you are so saucy, I won't blot it out. Depend upon it. We know better than to re repeal our masculine systems. She means, look, just because we are arguing for equal rights doesn't mean we want to run the entire show. We know that that that, that men are basically, mostly at that time anyway, going to be in positions of power and women are not necessarily. We're asking for a voice. We're not asking to, to drive the car here. And, you know, these people who say that, oh, women are becoming more and more insolent and they're becoming more disobedient to their to their husbands and whatnot. She says, that's laughable and I'm not going to I'm not going to put up with that kind of talk. She says, and in, and, and in, the May, in the May 7th letter, I cannot say that I think you are very generous to the ladies, for whilst you are proclaiming peace and goodwill to men, emancipating all nations, 
oh, here you are, you're creating the new republic and all this kind of stuff. You're freeing everybody. You insist upon retaining an absolute power over wives. You know, basically, how good is your revolution if it only counts for some? But you must remember that arbitrary power is like most other things, which are very hard, very liable to be broken. And notwithstanding all your wise laws and maxims, we have it in our power not only to free ourselves, but to subdue our masters and without violence throw both your natural and legal authority at, your, at our feet. In other words, we women have authority too. We have power. If you want us to make your life miserable, we can do that, right? Um, so be, be very careful in that regard. Uh, the bottom of the page is Mass Historical says that uh, women in colonial America had rights to vote in several of the colonies. Uh, they largely lost them in the creation of the Declaration, of, in, the following, in the years following the, um, the Declaration of Independence, and didn't get it back until 1920. Uh, 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 with the 19th Amendment on a national level, although there were some states and territories even that allowed women to vote prior to the establishment of the of the uh, of the 19th Amendment. Um, in any event, uh, gives us kind of an interesting picture there uh, of uh, of Abigail Adams, and um, we'll then take a look at our next subject, and that is Sarah Kimball Knight. And again, this is a little bit harder to read because this is very informal. I know it's a challenge to read it because it's really old, but it really does give us a slice of 18th century century life, uh, early 18th century life. Um, Sarah Kimball uh, uh, Knight was a um, was still in the Puritan strain, but she was a very different kind of Puritan than, say, Mary Rowlandson. Um, and that is, by the time 1704 rolls around, um, you've got a lot of people who are really moving to New England, not for religious persecution reasons, obviously, but for opportunity, um, maybe to escape persecution elsewhere, but but also primarily to make a living. And so commerce becomes an important motivator. And again, a lot of people were becoming wealthier with their endeavors, their businesses, shipping and agriculture and all kinds of trades. Ms. Knight is uh, from a family where they are doing well and making a good living. And she is what we would consider to be upper middle class, if not upper class at the time. So it gives us an opportunity from the perspective of somebody who's quite educated, quite uh, literate, but also rather privileged, okay, um, to see what her society looked like. Because on this journey, this is a business trip from Boston to New York and back again, um, she's able to run into all kinds of people. And they're very interesting and fun and um, really, really a, 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 just an, a joy to, to, to see her describe them. And of course, like a Puritan, she keeps a journal. You know, they're very introspective people, as we said when we talked about their view of literature. So she's still keeping a journal like a Puritan. She has very puritanical ways about her. She's a very religious person. But she also has a little bit more of a sense of humor. She's a little bit more urbane and worldly. She's a little bit more materialistic. She's about class as well as religion. Social class, social rank are important to her. And it comes through, especially as she runs into some rather rough characters. It also kind of reminds you that colonial America, New England especially, it's very likely that very upper class wealthy people would, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, constantly run into, run around with people from different classes, different races, different backgrounds. It was just, they intermingled a lot. They, they bumped into each other a lot. They had daily commerce together. Whereas today, wealthy people frequently just segregate themselves off from the rest of us unwashed, if you want to call us that. Um, the wealthy, the higher class people are really segregated uh, in much of our society today, but that was not the truth, and that was not the case in 1704. Now, one of the things that you notice is how hard travel was. There really weren't much in the way of roads. What, what they called roads were basically just rocky paths that washed out, flooded out, all that sort of thing. The other things that you notice in the text is you pretty much had to go from place to place and take what you got when it came to stay in the night someplace. Some of these places that they called inns were just people's houses, where, as you saw, the woman of the house would say, well, this is what we've got for dinner. Do you want some old mutton or some dried up pancakes? And that's about all we got. And because, I mean, you would just, you, there were, they were people who lived along that route who were known to take people in for the night. And what you got in the way of food or what you got in the way of a bed was really 
I mean, catch as catch can. And some places were nicer, and some places were flea bag places, uh, leaky roofs, and whatever you got. I mean, it really was. You were Airbnb in it. Only you, the people that you you were staying with were there. Um, not you just weren't renting a place. And so, you know, here's a lady who is middle age, and um, she's in good shape and everything. But at the same time, she is going to be concerned about traveling through this wilderness area all by herself. Now, there were Native Americans there, but for the most part, those hostilities had pretty much gone and died down, and the ones that lived there had sort of either moved on to other areas or were integrated pretty well in, in, into English colonial society. So it really wasn't the worry that I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get scalped or something or, you know, kidnapped by the Native Americans. It was mostly robbers or wild animals or just getting stuck as she crosses these rivers and is consistently concerned about drowning because you're just, you know, maybe she didn't know how to swim. I'm assuming she didn't know how to swim very well. Um, but um, those kinds of hazards were real. Um, so she either hires guides like the one named John, who was not a very talkative fella, who wanted a drink of uh, rum and uh, half of an eight pence, uh, eight, uh, a piece of eight, which is a silver coin. Um, not a lot. Didn't, didn't require a lot. So you would hire a guide or the post. You would follow along with the post. You would travel with the post. So the fellow who was hired to deliver mail from one spot to another, you would just tag along with him, okay? So, you know, he's going to be on horseback, and, and it was kind of double duty. They, it was understood that they needed to help not just deliver mail, but, keep, you know, um, help travelers get from point A to point B, at least on their route. So, you know, it was, it was well known which stops you could make, where you could find places. And if you didn't know that, your hired guide or the post would know. So that's kind of a little background on, on that. Some of the more colorful people, as you saw, that she runs into are, well, one of the, one of the first places, the guys who were drinking, uh, the drinkers. Um, and she decides, she's in her room, she's hearing them, they're drinking, they're getting loud and rowdy, and she's like, shut up, I want to go to bed. And so she decides, I'm going to write a poem, and maybe my poem will help cast a spell over these drunks so they'll go to bed. And so she says, they kept calling for another gill. Uh, why, why they were swallowing was some intermission. But presently, like oil to fire, increased the flame. I set my candle on a chest by my bedside, and setting up, fell to my old way of composing my resentments in the following manner. In other words, she loved writing poems, just for herself, right, for her own amusement. Um, and she says, I ask thy aid, O potent rum. So this is a poem to the god rum. Um, to charm these wrangling toppers dumb. Please shut them up, right? Toppers or drinkers. Thou hast their giddy brains possessed, the man confounded with the beast. And I, poor I, can get no rest. Intoxicate them with thy fumes. Oh, still their tongues till morning comes, right? <laughs> oh, potent rum, please make them so drunk that they shut up and fall asleep. And she says right after that, they pretty much fell asleep. So it was pretty good. Um, she makes a, a real uh, play on words here. It's a little bit hard for us to... Uh, to, to decipher it in a way. Then one of the next stops is she stops at a place. Undoubtedly, the guy's real name was DeVille, okay? However, she makes a great deal out of calling him Mr. Devil because he and his whole family are just really low-life scum of the earth and really a horrible place to have to stay the night. The food's terrible. She said, but I question whether we ought to go to the devil to be helped out of affliction, right? So she's doing all these puns, like I'm going to go to the devil or we had a devil of a time, all that kind of stuff, because the guy's name is probably DeVille. But meeting his two daughters, as I suppose twins, they so nearly resembled each other, both in features and habit, and looked as old as the devil himself and quite as ugly. Oh, oh. Um, we desired entertainment, but could hardly get a word out of them till, uh, till with our, and then it leaves off a little bit, importunity, telling them our necessity, etc. They called the old sophister who was sparing in his words as his daughters had been, and no uh, or none was the reply had to our demands. In other words, it was customary if you stayed at a place that they would feed you, they would put you up, and Sometimes, you know, they would say, oh, our daughters play the, you know, they're not the piano, but they might play or sing or do something or, or uh, entertain you in some way. Uh, these are really little backwoods folks. Um, the daughters are kind of homely and um, they look like the devil and it's like, 
they don't say anything. They're not real bright, and so you're not going to get any entertainment tonight. They don't sing. They don't dance. They don't do anything. And she writes another poem and says, May all that dread the cruel fiend of night keep on, and not his, not at this accursed mansion light. Tis hell, tis hell, and devils here do dwell. Right? Don't stay at this place, man. It's a terrible place. It's like staying in hell. The food is horrible. Here dwells the devil. Surely this is hell. So this, this particular place for lodging was not a good spot, and the guy's name reflected it. Um, you also see her travel by this really poor man's hut, which gives you this indication that there were some people who were just desperately poor. She's like, you know, his, his house is practically like living outdoors. I mean, it's made out of nothing. How this guy survives, uh, I mean, this, this it doesn't get any more poor than that. Um, she also runs into people in different parts of Connecticut, which is where she's traveling through with different traditions and different customs. And let's not, let's not sugarcoat this. The lady had attitudes and the lady had ideas that were not uncommon for the time. That's no excuse. But at the same time, they were, they were, um, you know, she had her views on Native Americans and on African Americans and believed that, you know, she was superior. There's just no way around it. It's hard because in this day and age, people want to say, well, if someone says something that we don't like and that our values shun, then we should just have nothing to do with them. Um, and that's the opposite of years ago when people would never bring up the fact that people in American history had really, really unpleasant attitudes. Uh, my perspective is, you know, there's a lot to like and dislike in just about every human being. And as long as you're honest about what there is to like or dislike about them, then I think you have the full measure of the person. And that's the best you can do. In my view, in my mind, uh, there's a lot to like about Sarah Kimball Knight. But when she basically complains that uh, in Connecticut, people who owned slaves ate with them and that you know, the white hand would would uh, would uh, reach into the bowl of food along with what she calls the black hoof. And that's the idea that black people were devils. Right. That that was that that was the idea. That's a pretty nasty thing to say. It's a it's a very racist thing to say. <sighs> Is she a racist? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, as many people back then were, no question about it. That was the dominant attitude. Um, there's no excuse for that. But at the same time, there's a lot to like about her. Um, not that, but other things. Um, she also talks about the Native Americans in town and how <clears throat> they they really are motivated by drinking and alcoholism, which is something that has long plagued many Af Native American communities. And she kind of pities them in some ways. She talks a lot about the economy. She talks about she gets a chance to go to New York City. She's very impressed with New York City. It's a thriving place at that time, 1704. Boston was the biggest city in North America for decades and decades. New York was the biggest city only after uh, the revolution, to be honest. It was Boston that was the largest metropolitan area. It was the center of commerce and, and literacy and, and, and culture. New York only came along later. And then, of course, it eclipsed Boston in both size and importance to the economy and such. But even there, you can see this early glimpse where she says, hmm, this place has got a lot going for it. It's in a right spot. It's got good harbors. It's got good rivers. And this place is coming along nicely. Well, yep, that's right. Um, she gets a chance to do that. So she views literature as something for her own amusement or edification, just for fun or for educating herself. Poetry and prose are, are there to amuse you and to help you recall the experiences and read about it a little bit later on. Um, one of the things to notice that I think is kind of interesting here is look how long this journey took. I mean, she left in October and she didn't come back until basically New Year's. That is a long time. Now, she spent some time there uh, conducting business, but it wasn't terribly late. It took a long time to get there and back. It was no, This was a huge undertaking. If you think about it today, it's don't measure distance in miles. Measure it in time, right? Because back in, the, in that day, a, a journey from Boston to New York was just many, many days. And if you put that in modern terms, that would be like going from here to, gosh, I don't know, South America, driving almost, really. That, that would be a long, long, long drive. So, you know, it, it, don't underestimate. Say, well, it's from Boston, New York. That's, not, that's just kind of a jaunt. Not with what she went through and not with what you had to, to deal with at the time and not with how long it took. So it took a long time. One other little thing that you might notice is that she makes absolutely no mention whatsoever of Christmas. And the reason for that is that Puritans didn't celebrate Christmas. Uh, they felt that it was a pagan holiday that had been 
sort of adapted to Christianity, which is probably true, um, and that it was, you know, the ancient pre-Christian uh, celebration of the winter solstice. And so Puritans were very big on not celebrating Christmas at all. And so she may, she basically takes no mind of it once whatsoever, or New Year's for that matter. Um, 24th comes and goes, and 25th, there's no mention. There's just nothing in the journal about it whatsoever because it doesn't interest her. Um, they would not have practiced that. No Christmas trees, none of that. That's why Puritans have a reputation of being kind of dour and sour pusses, um, spoil sports and all that sort of thing. Um, anyway, so I hope you got a few nuggets out of here that I think are really worthwhile um, and give you a chance to sort of get a flavor. This gives you a flavor of, of what it was like to be alive then, right? And, and I know it's from the perspective of somebody who's upper class, and I know it's Sometimes she'll say things that we find rather distasteful or not very appealing about her. But you know what? That, that she's a human being and very human in her in the way she comes across in this. And um, um, we're not to be surprised by the fact that that's the way some people were at the time. Anyway, let's uh, let's go on to uh, quiz number two. Uh, I'd like to get this from you if I can. Uh, I'm going to alter this uh, by midday on Friday because these got, um, I apologize, I've been trying to upload these and they, they, the power keeps going out and YouTube keeps taking its time. Um, so I'm going to extend that. Uh, it says on the screen there, midnight on Thursday. Let's do noon by Friday just so if you got a little bit of, of a delay there because of all this, then... Uh, you can get that in in time. Number one, what possession did Mary Rowlandson acquire during her captivity that meant the most to her? Number two, what skill did Rowlandson have that the um, Native Americans desired and were willing even to pay for it? And number three, what did Ms. Knight fear most on her journey? What did she claim to be terrified of? You'll have to read in there. I didn't bring that up too much, but you'll have to read in there. Eh, brought it up a little bit um, and find that. And there's a bonus question, a bonus question. How much ransom was paid by Rowlandson's husband, okay? Get that to me by email, noon Friday, not midnight Thursday. Thanks.